Well, then, uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to this morning edition of SPCLB Cast, where we are uh, super happy and super lucky that uh, Albert Cohen from uh, Google DeepMind agreed to present his work on uh, compiler cakes and, and eating them, of course. <laughs> so without further ado, I'll, I'll give the word to Marcin, who's going to introduce him more formally. And thank you, Albert. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you. Albert is a research scientist at Google. In the past, he has been a research scientist also at INRIA and a visiting scholar at the University of Illinois. He was also an invited professor at Philips Research and a visiting scientist at Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research. Without further ado, all the stage is all yours, Albert. Thank you, Marcin and Tostin. I'm very glad to be here. It's, uh, it's great to see you all. I would prefer to be there in person, but uh, at a future occasion, um, uh, hopefully. Um, so yes, it's going to be about cake um, and about being kind of eager to, to eat it as app uh, because we are like uh, performance uh, uh, engineering people and interested in, in speed and uh, it's all about acceleration these days. So I, I go through like um, step by step, uh, one hour at a time uh, from uh, um, typical ideas about how to make compilers um, uh, sweet and how to eat them uh, uh, quickly. And um, also some, some stories that may not be uh, all about success in the past in, in this area and uh, mostly brush some, some areas for research because this is not about telling you, yeah, this is how you do it. It's more about inviting you to, uh, to help and, and do research. Um, so I've been working in this area for, for quite some time. And um, um, these days it's actually quite common to consider that whenever there's an optimization problem, whenever you want to solve um, a combinatorical optimization problem, you would use ML uh, because this is uh, faster. Uh, this is much easier. You don't have to uh, look for very hard into um, uh, algorithms books, etc. And uh, in many cases, we have no clue what the machine is doing anyway. Uh, even at small scales, uh, processor complexity is just mind blowing. Uh, so why not about using ML? I mean, it, it, it makes complete sense. So, so the first idea when you're Cooking the cake is start at 1 p.m. Uh, uh, with, with ML. Um, let's see. So uh, as I said, I've been working in the area for long enough uh, that um, uh, before it was called auto-tuning, uh, this was called like iterative feedback directed optimization. And there have been a lot of iterations on this. Um, uh, these days, people use uh, very fancy uh, either, either differentiable programming techniques or reinforcement learning. Um, with compilers in the loop. Uh, as we'll see later, it's not that easy actually to do RL with compilers, uh, but some of you in the audience, I guess, uh, have done it before. Um, so I, I just want to highlight one research that uh, took place um, uh, in, uh, in our group, uh, in our lab, uh, led by uh, Mangpo uh, at Google Brain. So that was before we became Google DeepMind. Um, uh, it was presented at PACT a couple of years ago. I, I'm highlighting it because it's a kind of classical auto-tuning approach at the surface because it's about tuning flags in ML compilers, uh, XLA in this case. I'll say more about XLA in a minute. Um, but if you look into the paper in, in detail, uh, and uh, this is actually very impressive what's happening in there because this is, first of all, all in production. This is happening uh, while the system is building, while people are uh, contributing patches, while, uh, um, uh, while incremental testing and uh, uh, um, um, all, all kinds of proce uh, production processes are taking place. Uh, and it's affecting services that billions of people use. And, and it's, I don't think there is anything that compares to that in, in, in the world outside of this uh, 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 like behind the scenes auto-tuning process uh, uh, that Google has, in particular in the case of, of uh, ML compilers. So you, you can take a look at this paper. It's two years old, but it's very much state of the art still regarding auto-tuning. I won't say much more, but I want to highlight that auto-tuning is only one um, uh, approach to embedding uh, ML into compilers. Uh, we are more interested in helping compiler people uh, uh, like automate some of our difficult tasks, as I was uh, hinting at earlier. So you, you don't want to write complex algorithms at all. It's not just about tuning flags. You really want to automate the process of building complex compiler optimizations. Typically, one approach to that is ML-based uh, heuristics. So I'd like to zoom in on, on another production um, compiler uh, result in that field, which is called MLGo. So that was a paper by my colleague uh, uh, Mircea Trofin uh, and others at, at, um, from, uh, from Google as well, um, published a couple of years, uh, of years back. Uh, and this is uh, uh, right now in LLVM. Uh, there have been multiple steps. I think the latest one was in LLVM 14. And it's both about code size optimization and, um, uh, and register allocation, more specifically the live range eviction subpass, uh, subtask of, um, of the greedy register allocator of LLVM. So I won't go into details, but um, the idea is that you can actually replace um, handcrafted heuristics in LLVM 
uh, not only for publishing nice papers, but actually to serve the needs of uh, a wide range of uh, uh, LLVM users, whether you're interested in compiling for CPU or GPU, and um, uh, both uh, inlining and um, register allocation being very classical optimizations, uh, it's actually quite of a, a challenge because you have to compete with uh, decades of, uh, of research in building such, uh, such heuristics. So once again, these are kind of state of the art. I mean, the, the people expect now that ML is making its way into, uh, into compilers. Um, uh, more uh, on the research side and definitely far from production, we had some collaboration with, uh, actually the work is led by colleagues from I IIT in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, and there was a paper at CC, uh, Compiler Construction last, um, uh, uh, last February. Um, it's called rl 4 Rio, And I'd like to zoom in a little bit uh, also because this work is using a representation learning approach um, called ir 2 vec which kind of relates to some work that happened in, uh, in your team uh, in, in Zurich, uh, 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 like from, uh, from InstoVec to Programmo uh, in particular. Um, so let, let me just uh, uh, recall the, the, the basics. I mean, register allocation is definitely not the most exciting topic of, uh, of the day. Uh, you probably want me to give a talk on Gemini, but I won't and I can't. Uh, but register allocation is, is probably the next challenge for, uh, for, for compilers for the next few decades. It's not going to go away, even if it's 60, year, 60 years old, uh, just because uh, hardware resources are scarce and registers uh, are one of those most uh, uh, scarce and interesting hardware registers to optimize for. Um, so it's a classical NP hard problem, but that not in, 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 the, in the full sense of uh, the register allocation problem. Just zooming in on one of the subtasks is already uh, reducible to graph coloring. And there are actually four uh, sub main subtasks in register allocation or, or more depending on how you count. And it's a mess basically because of these subtasks, not so much because of the NP completeness itself, you have heuristics in how these subtasks should interact. And that leads to multiple register allocators uh, uh, in LLVM, uh, some of them being more applicable to different subs to, to some, some contexts. Um, so the, the typically the, like the best uh, effort register allocator, the, the, the one that will apply to most common case uh, examples is the so-called greedy register allocator. Um, uh, as the name doesn't say, it's actually quite uh, advanced. It's not just a greedy heuristic. Um, and uh, uh, just to mention a little bit more detail about those four subtasks, uh, typically register allocation is about uh, live range splitting when you have interferences between registers. So before actually saying, I don't have enough registers, you can try to break things into pieces. Uh, so that you get um, more chances to avoid those conflicts, those interferences. Uh, the symmetric uh, uh, operation is called coalescing. So that typically happens in the back end. So when you're done with uh, register allocation decision, let's try to actually uh, unsplit. So remove re register moves typically. Uh, and then there are spilling and evictions, which are uh, also kind of symmetric. So spilling is when there is no other choice. You don't have enough registers, you go to memory. And eviction is, is sometimes actually because of this heuristic as pro uh, approach, Although you may have found a, a free register, later on some constraints may force you to evict that register and, and, um, and, and move it back to memory, or basically, or at least try again, let, let's say. So it's kind of an iterative process, and that sounds immediately very nice for people looking for re um, applications for reinforcement learning, because this is definitely some kind of environment that, that has a state that, uh, with, with, with which you can react uh, from in the ML model, and it's not an easy task that is just pure combinatorical. Um, and, and so that, that's interesting, but it's also very complex. Uh, it's complex because of these multiple subtasks, so that in particular, rl 4 real has approached the problem from a um, um, like hierarchical RL uh, perspective. Um, and it's complex because it's not just about soft optimization. We, don't, we are not going to compile code that uh, billions of people rely upon uh, by meeting like a 99.999% correctness target. We want 100% correctness. Of course, we don't have that, but the goal of compilers is to generate code that just works. Uh, we don't want um, uh, statistical guarantees on, on, on correctness. Um, and uh, so that's not something that ML typically has been very strong at. So we need to interact between uh, optimizations, which are going to be led by uh, ML heuristics or ML uh, algorithms, and, uh, and correctness that is going to be our filter for, for, for correctness uh, eventually. Uh, for example, register type constraints, you cannot fit any value in any register or not any register can be used in any instruction. And the live range constraints I mentioned earlier, like interferences. 
Uh, and the third type of uh, difficulty arises from uh, system infrastructure. Uh, as you can expect, compilers, uh, for, especially for large code bases, they are not written in Python. Um, so you have to interact between uh, um, um, models that are typically using a, a, a higher level uh, programming environment, typically in Python these days, and, uh, and more like heavily optimized um, compiler implementations in C++, maybe in Rust, et cetera, in the future. Uh, so rl 4 all does that. I'm going to quickly go through the, the interface uh, interfaces uh, and the, the, the interactions going on. So starting from source code, uh, you have to represent uh, the semantics of the um, uh, intermediate representation. In this case, it's the MIR of LLVM, uh, which is the machine IR equivalent of the LLVM IR. So it's, I, I, it's essentially more like details on the instructions and, and the types of operands are all lumped together into, um, into uh, representations of instructions. And uh, as is typically done in, the, in any ML approach uh, like that is not based on feature engineering, you just learn representations of this um, uh, syntactic intermediate representation of the, of the program. Uh, in this case, it's a variant of IR2VEC, which is called MIR2VEC, uh, that gives you embeddings, 100-dimensional uh, embeddings. I'll say more about it later. Uh, and we train those embeddings uh, and freeze them separately on, on, the, on benchmarks. When this is done, um, you can start building a kind of domain-specific optimizer for uh, register allocation uh, that's going to be used uh, in the, this RL, RL framework. And in this case, we use um, graph neural networks. So we take the interference graph of, of live ranges uh, and we abstract it into, uh, uh, through the embeddings into uh, graph neural networks. Uh, and the question is, uh, how do you get from LLVM graphs with embeddings into actual graph neural networks that are operationally modeled in Python um, using PyTorch or JAX or, or TensorFlow? And this, in this at least uh, first research experiment, was involved in process, um, involving interprocess communication via gRPC. Uh, mechanisms. So it's kind of heavy. You have serialization, deserialization, all kinds of distributed systems uh, problems that pop up. I mean, one one part of the system can can uh, just fail uh, or, or take a long a long time. Uh, that, that, that on the system side is pretty uh, hairy, as as I was hitting at earlier. Uh, so once you communicate through the to the RL framework, your GNN is now something you can actually uh, execute, uh, and you can process it through multiple agents. <coughs> corresponding to the different uh, subtasks I mentioned. Uh, and the, those uh, agents will typically take one node at a time in the graph and um, decide whether it wants to split it or color it. And uh, then the agent itself will, uh, depending on the task, uh, interact with the compiler again. So in the case of splitting, you have to update the graph. So you go back to LLVM and you ask LLVM to update the graph in its own representation and then send you back the results uh, through the, the gRPC mechanism, quite costly but interesting from a research point of view. And if in case of uh, <clears throat> coloring, uh, it's something that can entirely take place within the R framework itself. You don't need to uh, involve uh, LLVM. So just to give you a high level view of what's going on, when it's done, you return to LLVM with the um, color map. Uh, the graph has already been updated. Uh, LLVM can complete the work and generate uh, machine code. And you can measure performance, which is not the easiest part of the problem, uh, by the way. Um, to cut the story short, uh, we have been training uh, both the, the representation and the, and the, um, uh, the, the RL policy, the RL uh, algorithm with PPO policy on, the, on spec benchmarks uh, and C++ boost libraries. Um, the, as I said, it's 100 dimensional embeddings trained over 1000 epochs. Uh, and we evaluate on the also spec uh, with uh, both x86 and the ARM architectures. By the way, if you have any questions, um, don't hesitate to, to, to raise a hand and I guess Martin will interrupt me. Uh, and uh, we take the full problem, uh, not just like one narrow uh, range of uh, registers or instructions. We take all the instruction sets with all the register classes into account. So it's a huge amount of work from the, from the PhD students and, and, uh, and um, uh, also undergrads uh, at IIT who, who did that. I don't have time to go into performance results uh, in detail. Just the, 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 the top level story, the TLDR, is that it's pretty comparable to state of the art. So greedy, which generally performs the best, uh, we kind of outperform it on x86 in the majority of the cases. Some, so when it's green, um, uh, that means uh, rl 4 real is best. When it's yellow, it means it's second best. So one of the other techniques is, is, is best. Uh, and there are variants of rl 4 real that we also consider uh, whether we use global or local um, uh, cost models uh, in the, um, uh, in the, to feed the, the, the training process. Uh, and, uh, but this is not necessarily, uh, uh, sorry, to feed the, the decision process in the RL algorithm. But this is not uh, something I have time to go into uh, in details. Um, 
the fact that you can automate all these um, like decades of, of, of work from from competitor engineers engineers is was the the, the main uh, achievement here. Uh, hopefully, we'd like to do even better, and there, there is still work in progress in this area. Um, so, some lessons learned here um, is yes, you can do production stuff uh, based on existing compilers. You can also replace compilers internals uh, using uh, ML and hope for more automation in the future and also even better performance uh, in the end. Uh, automation being the key here, because I remind you that the, 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 the main message of the talk is that we want to eat our cake early. So we need uh, compilers engineers essentially to be, to be out of the loop uh, as much as possible so that uh, the, the cook can actually uh, do something else. Um, so because we also identified that a big, change, a big challenge with um, ML in compilers is about compiler ML model interactions on communications, we have also started some work specifically more like on the methodology side. How do you uh, interact between ML compilers and, um, sorry, between compilers and ML systems? Um, and there was a presentation at the um, uh, LLVM dev meeting last a couple of months ago, uh, since uh, still in collaboration uh, between um, uh, the, the, the Googlers working on uh, uh, ML Go and uh, the, the group at IIT Hyderabad. And, um, Again, I won't dive into details. Um, there is also an archive paper that, that, that says a bit more about that. But we have been looking at more optimizations in this case. Um, uh, also, loop distribution, still RL-based, uh, pass ordering or pass uh, selection, uh, and um, uh, RL4EO that I already mentioned. And as you've seen, it's kind of naive to use RPC mechanisms uh, from, uh, from a Let's say uh, if you want to, to make those compiler techniques available to 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 wider uh, range of applications, is way too heavy. Uh, but it's not easy to 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 actually implement a, a workaround. Uh, so the, the end result, like the TLDR, once again, is that you can save uh, more like two orders of magnitude of overhead sometimes by getting rid of this this RPC. But the question is how basically. And and uh, there are two main approaches: either you do inter-process or you do in-process communication. Uh, in process, you can you can typically use uh, like pipes or like FIFO type of um, uh, 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 sorry inter process you can use pipes like in FIFO FIFO type of things uh, across uh, Unix style processes or you can use RPC if it's even across uh, nodes um, using uh, the network uh, in process you can use shared memory um, directly through library calls so TensorFlow has an uh, has an API for doing that uh, you ahead of time compile the model and uh, you get um, a library interface for, for, for querying the, the, the models and loading the weights, etc. Or you can convert your model to a portable format like ONNX uh, that is used both as an interchange format across ML frameworks and also as a means to, uh, uh, to, to convert a, a Python model into something that runs um, kind of almost standalone with a very small C++ runtime. Um, maybe you're familiar with um, uh, Lama.cpp, which is like uh, Facebook's, uh, uh, like Meta's uh, Lama model, open source, uh, re-implemented in, in C++. So that's yet another way of doing these things, but then you have to do it by hand. And that we definitely don't want to do that. In this case, we're interested in automating the process of taking the model that has been uh, trained and adapting it for uh, uh, embedding it into a compiler. Uh, so you can use pipes. Uh, you can use uh, gRPC, I already mentioned. Uh, I'm going fast. You can use these libraries more details in the presentation of the um, uh, LLVM dev meeting and in the archive paper. The, the, the interesting takes is that none of these solutions, whether it's in process or inter process, uh, serves all purposes uh, well. So once again, from a methodological point of view, uh, if you want to eat your cake uh, early, it depends what type of cake in a, in, a, in a way. So if you're interested in training, you may actually want um, a very large scale uh, environments with multiple nodes and multiple GPUs or TPUs per, per nodes. And for that, you typically need um, gRPC. You want, to dis you, you want to pay the price uh, at some level that is at least you can amortize the communication overhead uh, with, uh, with scale. Uh, on the contrary, if you're interested in robustness, you just want to make the compiler as reliable as possible. Uh, distributed systems is not the way. So you want to embed everything in process with library calls with either on when an or TensorFlow. And there are all kinds of other considerations to consider. Uh, but that's that's kind of good news from um, a systems perspective because we, we actually have to build that and explore these different avenues. It's not so good news from um, a production side, uh, uh, from a pro production perspective, because that means uh, maintaining a compiler with ML model into it is not going to be just as transparent uh, as, um, as current uh, 
compared us with uh, human uh, design heuristics. So there's still some research to be done, I think, on the methodology and maybe some uh, ML modeling uh, side as well, because we may not necessarily want to stick with the frameworks we have today if we are going to embed them in, into uh, production systems like compilers in the future. So, okay, now it's 2 p.m. Uh, we still don't have our cake yet, so uh, we, we, we are get, kind of getting uh, hungry, I guess. Uh, so the, the typical shortcut that compiler people take, uh, so once again, don't hesitate to interrupt, uh, when, when people get, uh, get impatient is, okay, let's ditch the general purpose compilation problem altogether and let's focus on a specific domain because we don't want to compile the world. We just don't, we typically want to compile one type of uh, compute in intensive application that we care about. So this is all about domain specific compilers. Uh, so that's once again, not a new thing. I'm just going to zoom in on tensor compilers because this is what we care about. Um, and um, <coughs> JAX is typically the, the kind of the preferred way of uh, uh, programming uh, linear algebra uh, uh, in, in ML at Google. And uh, it's also a very popular framework in, in, um, in, in education. And if you care, care about programming language design, it's typically uh, much more, uh, let's say, mature based on experience from previous uh, ML frameworks uh, in terms of uh, pure uh, functional language concepts and the advantage of having just math equations uh, similar to NumPy and being able to compose them with all the features of a functional language uh, with the transformations. Uh, so in this case, I won't go, go into details, but what JAX offers is uh, NumPy-like uh, operation and the ability to apply all kinds of uh, optimizing, parallelizing, vectorizing, uh, uh, automatic differentiation transformations on top uh, and compose them almost in arbitrary order. So you can write your loss function, you can write your, 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 your forward um, uh, uh, model and then everything falls through. So you get, uh, you get your, 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 your reverse mode that, uh, uh, automatic differentiation done for you. You get a kind of optimized JIT compiled code for, for both. Uh, all the checkpointing heuristics are in there and, uh, and you, you, can, you can get uh, parallel and distributed versions of it uh, starting from a very simple source code. And this is not just in this nice kind of slide. This is the reality. If you look at, um, uh, I mean, also if you look at PyTorch uh, 2 with uh, Torch Inductor, you have similar benefits, but the, 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 the code itself of uh, state-of-the-art ML, ML models, uh, the, like the math uh, representation is actually very small. Uh, you get a huge amount of complexity in the stack uh, for good and bad reasons, uh, because of data, because of distribution, et cetera. But the model itself that, 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 that um, a model engineers, um, a model architecture search, for example, applies to when you try to optimize your model for a given purpose is actually a, a small piece of code. And this is a huge success, I would say, from, from, from a compiler point of view, because something like JAX is probably hard to imagine in high performance computing uh, uh, like just 10 years ago. The, the, the amount of uh, high of, of uh, the, the level of abstraction you get from these functional programming uh, abstractions uh, in uh, in a dynamically typed language, even uh, with all kinds of fancy features that, uh, in terms of composability, that combines with extremely hard perform high performance on, on accelerators like GPUs and TPUs, it was hard to imagine. Uh, I mean, people, yes, have been dreaming about it, but it was hard to to find in in the real life um, uh, before ML came in. Uh, so that's all about domain specific um, optimization, but JAX is not only about ML. I just want to uh, recall that there are a lot of scientific applications that use uh, ML frameworks and JAX is, uh, is one of them. A lot of people actually in uh, HPC use ML frameworks as a backend more because it's a, it's a easier uh, uh, way to, to use like collective communications, I would, I would guess, uh, on, on large scale systems. And it has all kinds of checkpointing, uh, like robustness uh, guarantees that may be harder to use uh, using MPI. So I won't say too much, too many bad things about MPI in this, in this crowd, but definitely it's easier to use for many people. And, and also it's nice because it's a front end that can let people play with um, uh, 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 the like, composability uh, at, at, with much higher productivity. So science is also one of, I mean, subdomains of science can also be domains uh, of specialization for, for compilers, thanks to uh, systems like JAX. And of course, JAX is not uh, alone. JAX, JAX is only the upper layer. What happens underneath is you have uh, just another domain-specific compiler, which can be used just in time or ahead of time, which is called XLA uh, or OpenXLA these days. Um, and it's essentially specialized on what we call high-level op uh, operation graphs, uh, HLO graphs. So it's not uh, programmable in the sense that you have uh, control flow and uh, primitive data types and you build data structures uh, and you essentially get like a Turing complete uh, execution and uh, 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 like semantics uh, based on those, on, those, on those primitives. It's more like 
yes, there is a well-known set of ops that everybody needs. And uh, hopefully this is going to be enough for your model. Uh, and we are going to implement like optimizations that are specific to these ops, um, like fusion, tiling, buffer allocation, layout, assignment, etc., and code specialization for different uh, targets like CPUs, GPUs, and TPUs. And uh, so it's, it's similar to, to a, a traditional compiler in, in the sense that it has passes, uh, it has code generation, uh, so-called emitters that kind of uh, specialize those operations for different targets. Uh, and uh, it, it has been reasonably successful in the sense that um, it's one rare occurrence of a domain specific compiler that completely eliminates the need for uh, numerical libraries like written by hand in assembly in the case of, of uh, TPU platforms. At least that was the case originally. And I was in the next slide, you see it's not quite true anymore, but originally XLA was really the only way to program, um, uh, to program TPUs. And there are very few examples of such successes of even domain specific compilers that provide uh, complete isolation from uh, assembly programming. Uh, for for uh, very high performance computing, like near peak near, near peak computing, uh, performance computing. Uh, but in fact, it's actually yeah. It's uh, sorry, I skipped that slide. Yeah, in fact, it's uh, it's actually not quite true anymore. As I was saying, so if you look at OpenXLA, which is uh, like now the open source community driven uh, effort uh, uh, behind XLA that Google announced back in in May. Um, so we, we, we want to make it more uh, retargetable. So we want GPU uh, targets, of course. Uh, there are also all, all kinds of CPU companies, uh, uh, especially in the mobile uh, embedded edge world, interested in using XLA. Uh, and, uh, and, and people want optionality in general. So you don't want to rely on only one compiler base for, for, for one particular ML framework. So for example, PyTorch can also use uh, XLA. Uh, the, the problem is when, when you open the box, uh, you want more targets, for example, not only TPUs, it becomes a bit more difficult to have a one size fit all. Um, it's, it's already difficult on TPUs, but it's even more difficult when you have multiple targets in terms of um, optimization flow and, uh, and, and, code, and code emitters. Um, so what people end up doing uh, more and more is that, okay, we get, it's 2 p.m. as I said, so we, we are hungry. So in, in a way, it's sometimes easier to write low level code and, uh, rather than hacking into the, the XLA compiler. Even if it would be possible, maybe we lack expertise, we lack time, so we prefer to write a lower level code. Um, and this is typically what Triton has been popular uh, for on, on GPUs. So I call this kind of approaches um, uh, escape hatches. Uh, and uh, and um, uh, in the JAX world, there's something higher level than Triton that also has tracing compilation um, uh, with it, which is called Palace, uh, that composes better with um, uh, all the transformations of JAX. And uh, this is uh, uh, a high, let's say, high level. Um, high slash low level programming environment for JAX because you can do side effecting operations uh, with iterators on, on uh, uh, arrays uh, within the Python programming environment that looks, that combines well, that composes well with JAX. Uh, so you have some of the benefits of both worlds essentially. And Palace compiles to Triton in the case of, um, uh, of GPUs and it compiles to another intermediate representation in the case of, of, of TPUs, which abstracts vector operations and iterators in a more TPU uh, specific way. Uh, and all these tools are MLIR based. So I, I didn't say anything about MLIR based, but I, uh, MLIR uh, yet, but I will uh, in uh, very soon. Um, uh, it's essentially saying that we need a, a way to make it easier for escape hatches to come into a, um, a monolithic compiler like uh, like XLA, and more fundamentally, because it's going to be retargetable and multi-framework. Um, maybe you're familiar with this uh, uh, hourglass shape uh, design of compilers, where you have many front ends, many back ends. So you have an upper bulb and lower bulb, and you have this narrow middle end that's supposed to unify everything and serve both um, uh, the diversity levels at high level and low level. So MLIR is supposed to help you build this, uh, this infrastructure with a common middle end uh, that, that can be easily specialized for different uh, front ends and back ends. So this is basically where we are going today, but it is very much work in progress. So in reality, it's not that great. Um, as I said, <clears throat> you have a high level uh, programming environment and compiler like JAX or, or PyTorch. Uh, you have a, a middle end uh, tensor compiler like, like XLA <clears throat> that does all kinds of tricks in terms of fusion, uh, layout assignment, et cetera, that are domain specific. And you have a target, except that that's only really the case on TPUs right now. So more and more on the PyTorch side, um, uh, Torch Inductor and using Triton as a backend actually is, is uh, making progress on, on GPU, <clears throat> but it's still not quite very bright. So you have, excuse me, <clears throat> a lot of the <clears throat> heavy lifting on GPUs is still happening <clears throat> in, um, in libraries like uh, QDNN or actually Cutlass these days uh, uh, by NVIDIA. Same thing on the CPU side <clears throat> uh, with Intel, for example. 
Uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the reality is that compilers are still not necessarily delivering the peak performance you'd like uh, in, in, in practice. And this has been actually the case for many years. So there are people in the HPC world who got bored with compilers. So they got hungry. Uh, and at 2 p.m., they didn't see the cake coming. So why wait? I mean, why actually invest uh, into compilers? It has been like a brittle benchmark compiler type of, uh, <clears throat> of thread uh, for the longest time on, uh, on, on uh, before accelerators were the, were the norm in, in HPC. Uh, so engineering velocity is an issue. Even performance is not necessarily there <clears throat> uh, with um, high investment uh, into, into compiler efforts. So you could say, okay, maybe this is, uh, this is okay. There are some exceptions like XLA uh, um, and, uh, and maybe ML has enough, uh, uh, is, is enough resources to fund compilers, but, but, uh, but compilers are not for me if, I'm, if I care about performance because it's going to take too much time. So I, I'm going to try to convince you of the, the opposite, but yes, I'm going to also acknowledge this is still research. Okay, if you want performance, especially performance portability, you need to work. Uh, so this is a real problem, uh, I, also, uh, I would say, because, and I've said that before, but, and I'm not the only one, so my colleagues, uh, Paul Barham and Michael uh, Izzard have, have published this uh, mostly that uh, call for help paper uh, uh, on the machine learning systems are stuck in a rut like five years back. This is a real problem because uh, innovation is stuck. I mean, we are not making enough progress um, if we have to program systems at low level, uh, because like researchers and innovators in general are just not able to play with <laughs> the, all the features of the hardware and hardware researchers also are not able to innovate because they're kind of stuck with what the compilers uh, or what the, 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 the poor assembly programmers can, can deliver. Uh, so, okay, we had a little bit of cake. Uh, we get these XLA successes on TPUs, for example, but it's not enough. I mean, we need to, we need to continue the work. So it's now 3 p.m. Uh, what can we do? Maybe compiler construction is the solution. So we need better compiler infrastructure. Yes, so I mentioned that before. That's what we are doing. Uh, so we have MLIR, uh, which has been boiling uh, for now uh, four years, uh, a bit more. Actually, it was announced, uh, um, it was uh, open sourced uh, uh, like in September uh, 2019. Uh, this is all about building compilers in a more productive way, let's say, more agile way. Uh, and uh, sorry, yeah, <clears throat> uh, there was a presentation at uh, the LLVM dev meeting um, uh, that basically, uh, I think, I, I guess, clarifies many of the objectives in retrospect. So MLIR is not a new ML compiler. And there are a few other misconceptions. And my colleague, Alex Zinenko, I think I, I, I has delivered a great uh, overview of, of, of those misconceptions and what MLIR really is about. So this is really not about competing with XLA or competing with uh, Torch Inductor or any compiler that you may have uh, any domain specific compiler that you may have. It's about incrementally helping you to uh, design or redesign compilers in a, in a more extensible way. So essentially saving some of the uh, efforts that people before you have been through and capturing all the, those design patterns and all those good practices, data structures, um, uh, fundamental semantic invariants like SSA, et cetera, in a reusable fashion. Uh, so it may be more or less of a success depending on the field, but this is really the goal. This is not about competing with existing competitors. This is about helping improving them. Uh, so yeah, I don't have time to go into details. Once again, there are presentations of MLIR. There are all, all, all kinds of tutorials that are doing a great job on this, but the principles are really about um, parsimony, uh, traceability, meaning that you can very easily dump uh, the state of the, of the compiler flow at any moment, which is great for debugging and, uh, and understanding also performance uh, issues, like performance debugging. It's progressive, meaning that whenever something can be helpful to someone else, uh, maybe, you can, maybe you can branch at any point in the flow, like uh, I was talking about escape hatches. Uh, so that's absolutely essential. So if you do something useful, make it an entry point for someone else, essentially. So that progressivity is all about that. And it's, it's extensible because we want domain specific uh, uh, compilers. So we, need, we don't know exactly about uh, what the domains uh, will request ahead of time. And then how it's done, like built in IR concepts, you look into the, the presentations, you look into the code, you, 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 you'll find m much more actionable information there. <clears throat> the thing is, is, all, is if you want reusability, uh, you have to kind of forget about anticipating what, um, uh, what users will want. Uh, very different from LLVM, for example, or even or definitely high level domain specific abstractions like HLO, you don't want to, to guess. You don't want to say uh, maybe some, okay, I've looked at the domain very carefully. I know this is going to be what people need in practice and I'm going to build my system around this. Yes, at some point you're going to do that, but not necessarily yourself. Maybe someone else will do it, some other user. MLIR helps those guys do the right, uh, do the right thing. 
but when you're designing MLIR, you don't want to do that. You want to say, I want to help whatever users of compilers uh, that I didn't even think about yet. Okay, so does it even make sense? Okay, we tried. We have something that kind of uh, uh, achieves some success in several areas. Uh, you can look for yourself. But I, I think some of the principles of programming languages are there to show that at least there is some lo level of reuse that can be fundamentally uh, uh, like written down in a, in a, in a principled way and, and reused. Um, so, okay, I, I started with a pessimistic view on, on compilers for performance. Here is some kind of a path, I would say. Uh, uh, and as usual, when you're stuck, a typical path to get unstuck is to change the problem. Okay, so I'm going to change the problem twice in this presentation. This is the first time. Uh, performance is difficult. Performance portability is harder. Uh, so let's redefine performance portability. And uh, one way to redefine it is to get to ask for help. And of course, we are not the first to say that. Uh, there, there has been all kinds of approaches for, let's say, semi-automatic um, uh, code generation, uh, especially in domain-specific areas. And performance engineering has very much been about using some help from the compiler to do uh, uh, to apply some optimizations that would be painful to apply directly uh, in, in a in C, for example. Uh, uh, and, um, and there are different degrees of semi-automatic optimization. One of them is auto-tuning, so that's kind of production now. So you just leave some hyperparameter tuning to, um, to a system that will put the compiler in the loop of the system and, uh, and, and, and tune things for you. Uh, but that's kind of a, a cherry on the cake, I would say. Um, uh, if you want to really build a compiler based on auto-tuning principles, you have to open the box a bit further. So one approach to do that is scheduling. Uh, so scheduling is a means to control programming optimizations in, a, in an explicit way. So it's a metaprogramming approach, basically. So you may be familiar with Halide and TVM, um, which have scheduling languages that uh, essentially parameterize uh, code generation templates uh, that for Halide will, uh, will specialize on, on computer vision and image processing, and for TVM is about ML, um, like DNNs. And auto-scheduling is about figuring out these uh, schedules uh, automatically using, uh, using ML in general. Um, and uh, yes, this is still research. There have been good results uh, uh, that are kind of, uh, I, I don't know how much they are used in production by, by in the TVM uh, community, but at least they have been um, demonstrating satisfactory performance results, uh, although it can still be uh, very time consuming from a compile time uh, point of view. So this is still an area of research, I would say, uh, generally, but it's very encouraging. I say more about it. And then there is a kind of next step, which is, okay, let's forget about program transformations altogether. Uh, let's try to skip all the, these intermediate steps, or at least within some area of, uh, within some semantic gap that is well defined. Let's use program synthesis. Yes, let's use sketching. Let's use even maybe differentiable programming or reinforcement learning to search large spaces and generate code that implements a high-level semantics without telling the system how to generate that code. Just give the like the formal descriptions of the instructions of the assembly instructions, for example, and let the system figure it out how to assemble those instructions into something that makes sense. Uh, so this is, of course, still an area of uh, active research. Uh, scalability is a key issue here because it's very time consuming. Uh, but for some problems, it's, it's quite effective and it's very surprisingly uh, uh, more effective than even human expertise sometimes because there are so many things you can think of in a limited amount of time. Uh, there is yet another approach that I would say is more from the compiler construction side, which is uh, leveraging what we call structured operations, saying that if you want um, uh, to help performance engineers to achieve something, maybe don't tell them this is exactly the schedule, uh, scheduling language uh, you can play with, or this is not the metaprogramming framework like template uh, metaprogramming, etc. You, 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 you are given as a as a, as a playbook, but more, be less ambitious. Let's say, okay, you have building blocks. They have been designed for progressive refinement, as I was mentioning about uh, MLIR. So you have entry points at any level, basically, uh, and also exit point at any level. For example, if you have handwritten micro kernels in, in assembly, yeah, you can plug them into, the, into your system. And those structure operations are a way to unify these visions of metaprogramming and using building blocks that will help reuse what others have done, whether it's a top, uh, like top down or bottom up, uh, whether you have uh, high level operations, you kind of know how to fuse and tile, for example, which is like top down vision, or whether you have micro kernels that have been uh, hand optimized and you'd like to reuse them in a high level uh, framework. And, and if, you're, if you want to know more, there was a paper presented at the LCPC workshop uh, uh, earlier this, uh, last, last year and presented earlier, published actually earlier this year. So all of this, uh, I would say, is what I would call 
the area of controllable compiler optimizations, whether it's kind of manual when you write schedules by hand, for example, or whether it's automatic using auto scheduling. The, I think the field is very much um, in, in motion. Uh, and uh, I really invite people to work on this. If you're interested in HPC, yes, you can write lower level code. Um, uh, maybe Triton is popular these days on GPUs, but not necessarily reaching peak performance. And probably if you want more reuse, if you want a cake to look nicer at 5 p.m., you want to go beyond that. You want actually to reuse compiler blocks when uh, metaprogramming. And I think controllability like schedules is definitely the way for, for, for doing that. And there was a great presentation at the, um, uh, at the, ML, uh, uh, sorry, the, the LLVM dev meeting back in May, uh, a tutorial by Alex Zinenko and more recently by our intern Martin Luke from Edinburgh uh, at the dev meeting uh, in October, uh, which is exposing all of this at the Python level essentially. Uh, and it's nice programming language research as well. So please refer to those. those uh, and now I, I'm going to, 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 to conclude very soon. So the, uh, I guess we are still at 3 p.m. Uh, only, but uh, we, we, we see there is kind of a path. I, I'm not able to tell you this path will succeed because we have failed so many times in the past, but we, we still managed to get a little bit of taste at 2 p.m. already of domain-specific compilers that succeeded. So we have some level of encouragement. Um, so I, I think beyond uh, controlling, controlling compiler optimizations, uh, I would invite you to look into uh, one of those three directions as well. So, uh, so you want to work on the infrastructure uh, itself. For example, if you want peak performance, you, in general, you want cross-stack uh, optimization. So it's not only looking at one uh, uh, slice of the pie, you actually have to open the box and look uh, uh, vertically as well. Um, uh, if you want velocity uh, uh, as well. And one good example of this uh, that we are investing uh, in, in collaboration with uh, our colleague, uh, Billy Moses, uh, who graduated from MIT and will join UIUC next year as a prof. Um, uh, we are looking into automatic differentiation, which is, I think, one of the um, missing pieces of uh, middle-end compilers. Right now, autodiff is typically done at, at the front-end level, uh, either um, uh, like, for example, in JAX, uh, before going to XLA, uh, uh, and it's, or even, even higher level than that. And we are missing a lot of interesting interactions with um, optimizations. Uh, and and the, maybe you heard about the Enzyme project uh, at LLVM, which is showing how to do that at the exact opposite level, like very low level in LLVM, which with, with, with great potential. We, pro we can probably unify the, the, the two approaches and do things in the middle end, uh, like basically at any point in the, in the compiler stack. Uh, regarding automation, uh, RL is a great uh, research uh, uh, direction, but it's kind of costly. So maybe we can find also um, uh, simpler ways to automate, uh, 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 to, to bring in ML models into compilers, uh, uh, or at least reduce the level of um, complexity of the, of the models. Uh, but very much we have to look into that direction. Uh, so please uh, look into that. I know some of you have been looking into that. Um, and then finally, uh, a, a, still a little bit like cross stack uh, in the spirit, but moving further up. So model and compiler code design is very much um, uh, in, in, uh, in fashion these days. So if you look at, uh, I guess, from, uh, from, from your group, uh, SPQR is a, is a great example. Uh, so you, you can look at uh, how to combine quantization, sparsity research um, on, on, on fine tuning and on low rank adapters in, in the model space and implement libraries uh, like uh, optimize sparse uh, computation to make that actually successful in practice. And it doesn't come for free. Without doing both at the same time, you don't necessarily succeed in exploiting the intuitions you have about what could be done. And, and of course, I believe this can be optimized further using compilers, not just writing library code. And I'm in interested in hearing more uh, about this from you guys, but maybe at a later time. Um, so now it's 4 p.m. Uh, and I'm only, uh, I basically I'd like to, to leave some time for questions. So I'm going to conclude in a few minutes, but uh, what about pushing the problem to the next level? So this is something that uh, I've, I've said earlier. So when the problem is too difficult, maybe redefine the problem. And many, in many cases uh, in research, we just make the problem even harder uh, because we can publish further, but more seriously, because sometimes looking around the problem from a higher perspective gives, uh, gives more insight as well. And I think one of the insights here is that it has been difficult for compilers to find their, their, their way into peak performance, uh, partly because we were trying to let them compete with numerical libraries or compete with assembly programming. And in many cases, we succeeded. Uh, I would say for best default, common cases, compilers are just the only approach in practice. But in the case of peak performance, it's still an issue. And for HPC, this typically is what it's peak performance that, that, that matters. So maybe if you want to push one step further, we, we should say, okay, let's forget about even identifying a, spe uh, a specific set of, of library operations 
uh, that matter because if you just don't even know what functions you're going to implement and optimize, how could you do it by hand? Okay? You need a system to make it uh, automatic for you. And with, uh, with uh, generative AI, I would say, we don't know how, but we kind of guess intuitively that this will happen at some point. Uh, so the question is how, when, uh, at what cost, of, of course, but that's the way. I mean, we want to completely uh, get rid of that problem of uh, pre-identifying by hand which, uh, which narrow set of library functions we want to optimize. This has to be automated uh, eventually. Uh, so I, I've been advocating for this a couple of times already. So uh, I call it retiring linear algebra libraries. So we don't want to compete. We just want to get them out of the way. And uh, of course, this has been very unsuccessful in the past. So people have been trying to retire Fortran with the size of the language in the 80s. C++ was supposed to retire a, a, a while uh, ago, but it's still around. Uh, so <clears throat> maybe it's not that easy. Still, um, maybe just to sketch a proposal and invite you to, to do some work. Uh, I call it tile level operations. Uh, that came out from different uh, discussions, uh, uh, both inside and outside Google. Uh, Robert Hunt, for example, was giving some motivation uh, to, to, to look into that problem. Uh, the, the idea is that if you don't know yet which are the high level operations you want to optimize, uh, you still have an, uh, an ID in a, in a specific domain of, for example, in ML, um, maybe you don't know the shapes, maybe it's dynamic shapes, maybe you don't know which fusions will be relevant, but you have a good idea of what tensor uh, uh, and linear algebra there is. So you can define um, a kind of a, a, a domain uh, area where you're going to optimize. You can also define some kind of code size uh, constraints because you don't necessarily want to generate a library that uh, billions of uh, 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 like, like gigabytes uh, 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 large. Uh, and you have also some performance expectations. So you're, you're trying to optimize for given like near peak performance targets, for example. So that gives you a 3D space of optimization, domain, performance, code size. And you're looking for typically a 2D uh, surface, like Pareto Frontier in this uh, 3D space uh, that trades those, those, um, those three dimensions. And the TLO approaches uh, uh, says that at some level of abstraction, it's well known that it's, it's not worth to compile things statically anymore, or it's not worth to uh, specialize hardware circuits in metal anymore. That's all about the hardware software interface. So more broadly, there is a dynamic slash static interface. And um, below that, 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 that boundary, you want to optimize statically. You want to generate, for example, super optimized register allocations. Uh, because there is no, no other way to, to harness the, the peak performance on the core uh, uh, but to use registers. If you use memory, you're kind of going to lose like orders of magnitude right away. Uh, and above that, front, that, 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 that boundary, static compilation is more like comes in, in the way. I mean, it's actually slowing you down uh, in terms of both exploration of different ways of optimizing and even execution because you get, for example, a JIT compiler on, uh, on the way, which, which, which slows down the, 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 the research process, for example. So you want some kind of runtime dynamic dispatch of, uh, uh, above and, uh, and ahead of time compilation of uh, specialized uh, libraries below. Uh, and uh, I don't know how to do it. I mean, I have some, kind of, some, kind of, some ideas, of course, but I, I, I think this is really the, the key here is that those TLOs should not be predefined. You want to automatically infer from this Pareto surface, <clears throat> which are the tile level blocks that require static compilation, that require hardware acceleration, and above we'll figure out how to do dynamic dispatch. And tile level is, of course, not very well defined, but it's not the full tensor operation. Uh, obviously, it has to be more like, um, <clears throat> like L1 cache type of tiles or L2 uh, on, on, on uh, let's say, one, one core at a time on the CPU. Maybe it's block level uh, programming interface on GPUs, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested, please let me know. Maybe you're already working in, in, the, in those directions. We have done some early work that shows that this is actually um, uh, uh, feasible performance-wise. Uh, so if you look at AVX 512 uh, on Intel, uh, <clears throat> if you look at libraries like uh, MKL, uh, 1DNN, Eigen, et cetera, uh, sorry, not, uh, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the general idea is that people have a very small set of microkernels handwritten in, in assembly um, or, or LLVM IR. Uh, but there are actually many more than, than just a handful of them that make sense. Depending on the shape of your computation, maybe 30, 40 microkernels uh, are actually interesting and <clears throat> maybe even more if you have degenerate shapes with reduction parallelism as well. Um, so this is something you can explore automatically. In the case of 2D convolutions, we did it and we, we got better results than, um, than TBM Unsolved, for example, uh, at auto-scheduling uh, 2D convolutions. And that was a paper at uh, TACO last year. Uh, the, the general idea is you can compose microkernels of different shapes to uh, aim for any uh, dynamic shape uh, that you don't necessarily know in advance. 
Now, in this case, just realize that 128 is 12 times 6 plus 8 times 7. So maybe you can have two shapes uh, of microkernels, 6 and 7, uh, and replicate those multiple times uh, to, ask to, to actually reach the 128 dimension that, that you, you are aiming for. And this is something you can generalize. And I would, I would say most likely uh, that compose in a way that uh, we can build TLOs from, like tile level operations by assembling a few, um, uh, may, may, maybe thousands, but not billions of, of microkernels. Uh, so that's kind of, uh, that's it. I mean, we, have, we don't have time anymore. So what, what cake do we have now at this point? It's going to be a take home message, not much more than that. Uh, so I already highlighted uh, some interesting aspects uh, in compiler research. If you want ML uh, to help with compilers, definitely you need to work on communication and interaction uh, between the two worlds. Extensibility, this is what we have been working on um, uh, since uh, like uh, 2018 uh, at Google with the MLIR project. You want control, so this is quite popular in some area, in some domains, but it could be much more, uh, I think, active and effective as well. So schedules for metaprogramming, for example. And you want ML enable compilers to unify all of this uh, because this is all about making it easier uh, to put ourselves out of a job, essentially, uh, at automating the, uh, the, the, the heuristics uh, and even the construction of those compilers. Uh, so just to conclude on a, on a positive note, uh, maybe you heard many times compiler people talk about building, building blocks. Uh, I even did myself. Uh, so the, the ultimate building block um, uh, game is, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> Minecraft. So the only limit is your imagination when you have building blocks. But what about going one step further? And here I would like to quote Mae Jemison. Um, uh, who is the, who is an engineer and, uh, and also was the first African-American in space. Uh, and uh, she, she, I think, put it in a very nice way. So, of course, never limit yourself because of others' limited Im imagination, but also never limit others because of your own limited imagination. And I think um, uh, MLIR re is, is really uh, embodying this, uh, this kind of vision in, uh, in its own way. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Um... We will take now a Q&A session. So if you would like to ask a question, either put it in the chat and then I'll read it out or raise your hand and I will uh, unmute you. And I think Torsten has been uh, the first one. So let me unmute Torsten first. Yeah, thank, thank you, Albert, for this wonderful summary and, and overview talk. And, and that was quite deep. Um, so the, the whole talk, I got this vibe, which you actually made very explicit uh, in one of your later slides that you're aiming to replace performance libraries. And, and one of the interesting things is that some people would claim that performance libraries were the, the major success in performance engineering of our community. I mean, you could argue that this led to a Turing Award, right? MPI and, and BLAS and Atlas and all of these libraries. So do you, do you really think that we completely replace those libraries with a compiled approach or will they still play a role in the later, uh, in, the, in the future for kernels and things like this? Right, so so eventually, if we are all going to retire because of ML, and this becomes a moot point, but more 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 concretely, <laughs> yes. the 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 question is, is there going to be a role for the in the long run for libraries where the um, uh, let's say programmer interface is the the um, the tensor wide operation? Like if you have uh, your mathematical model, you don't even try to decompose it. Uh, into some kind of what I call tile level operations, but expose kind of naively the top level operations as a library interface. Uh, so we, yeah, libraries have been super uh, effective, of, of course, uh, but they have this long known drawback of um, hampering uh, like interoperation optimizations, like fusion obviously is one of them. Uh, Kennedy had this telescoping languages project in the uh, early nineties uh, uh, at Rice that was addressing this. Uh, we are still kind of stuck in this kind of trade-off. So yes, in many cases, you have local optimums, like libraries is one local optimum uh, in terms of performance, it's, it's, it's doing great, but we, are, we know we are missing maybe some, some optimizations. And in, as, as time passes, as more domains come in, as more innovation also into the math uh, comes in, we have seen that they have, they have been also uh, in the way of this innovation. So I'm not saying, I have a proof that we are going to get rid of them completely, but we should aim for that. Uh, and, and as much as possible, we already know that it's, it's, it's feasible. Uh, let's try with subdomains where we, we can actually get rid of them and, uh, and, and see what happens in practice. Try to be pragmatic. Yeah. 
Oh, that's that's an excellent point. I mean, what what we've been doing is is very similar in in this days framework that we were doing. We have these library nodes, but eventually, to to address the problem you mentioned of uh, fusing and I don't know across library call optimizations, I would generalize it to um, th those guys. You can unroll and then do something like the telescoping design. Yeah, that one wonderful answer. Thank you so much, Albert. You're, you're welcome. Yeah. I mean, this is. I think uh, I'm very excited about this the, this this research. I mean, I just don't really know how to attack it, but. Uh, but we have to, we, we can be pragmatic. <laughs> yep. Okay. And we also have Greg. Yes. Uh, thank you for the excellent talk. I really enjoyed that. So actually, I would like to somehow follow up on Torsten's question about the, well, libraries versus compilers. So uh, actually, I totally agree with, with your answer about the importance of this, let's say, interlibrary calls optimizations. But maybe I would also like to add, because you mentioned, for example, with the XLA that achieved near peak performance without specialized libraries on uh, TPUs, etc. Yep. But well, from my perspective, <clears throat> linear algebra is not only matrix multiplication. I mean, so if by linear algebra it means matrix multiplication, then I agree that we don't need specialized libraries for that because the compiler can do just generate the code. I mean, we know how to do it, but how about, for example, matrix factorizations, some um, uh, prime decompositions, SVGs, or sparse linear algebra. So there is so much more than it is this very simple matrix multiplication kernel. And how would you like, <clears throat> how would you imagine the compiler figuring out all the control flow dependencies, for example, mm -hmm. when you're finding pivots in LU decomposition or some uh, when you're factorizing diagonal matrix and you're doing local inversion. So I think right. this sounds like a very difficult task for a compiler. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, great, I mean, pretty broad question. So I could take a full hour to, to discuss that with you, but <clears throat> let me give two, two uh, sub answers. One of them is uh, to be pragmatic, you can say LU has a structure that we understand. So we're not going to completely ditch all the, the, the linear algebra work on LU. And you can, you can see this structured ops uh, approach as one means to formalize this. So you know how to decompose it like step by step on the outer iteration of the algorithm. Uh, and you have like uh, matrices of small, uh, smaller and smaller sizes that may at some point cross some threshold and be optimized in different ways, et cetera. So you have maybe a multi-layer algorithm, uh, algorithmic template in mind. So the, if, you, if, if you look at schedules, that's typically what people would do. So you would write a domain specific compiler that has this kind of algorithmic template in mind. And you say, okay, at some level, I want to branch from thread level parallelism to, um, to vector level parallelism. I want to parallelize reductions, or I want to do in place stuff, or I want to, dis to copy, or, or even at the higher level, I want to do MPI calls, et cetera. So or the, the, you, are, you are going to assemble multiple blocks that you kind of understand already. And some of these blocks are going to refine into um, a finer grain components that will exploit different parts of the parallel hardware. So that, that's one approach. Schedules are the typical way to assemble those blocks. And you may want to do auto scheduling on top to, to, to get the, the peak performance uh, automatically. And then there is the second answer, which is, uh, I really don't want to think about it that way. Maybe there, is, there are some kind of super optimization ways that people have not thought about. And, uh, and uh, so DeepMind had actually a paper on matrix product <laughs> still. <laughs> Uh, a, a while back on um, like a Strassen algorithm type of things uh, where we could actually realize that on small matrices there is still some some algorithmic benefits to um, uh, to harness uh, to harvest and uh, and, and uh, yeah, program synthesis is the way then. I, I, and, and then once again you can reuse some of the components you don't have to completely flatten the full thing so you can say maybe some part of vectorization I know how to handle so I'm going to use building blocks that are let's say a 2d vector intrinsics and on top of this, I'm going to grow um, an, an automatic synthesis problem, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So now it's not just about linear algebra in the strict sense. Of course, in ML, we have uh, like exponentials, uh, like activation functions, softmax, et cetera. Fusion with softmax is very hard these days. Attention, of course, uh, is all you need. I mean, not quite, not quite the case anymore, actually. This is, uh, in, in, this is moving. <laughs> this is moving, of course. It's been uh, six years now. Um, and and uh, uh, you can still write compilers for that. Uh, XLA has, of course, code emitters for uh, non-matrix product type of operations. Even 
uh, actually uh, Holesky factorization is one of the HLOs, uh, strangely enough. Uh, but uh, so you, you can do linear algebra, you can do beyond linear algebra uh, with um, uh, non-linear operations and fusion from one domain to the other is actually, I would say, a very strong motivation for compilers because it's too much work. I mean, there are too many, it's a combinatorical problem. There are so many uh, interactions between ops uh, that, that you, you don't want to do it uh, manually. Actually, uh, you mentioned tensors, or uh, I, don't, I forgot if you did, but uh, a tensor algebra is not just matrix product. Of course, as you guys know, uh, TTGT is, is fine. So you can do transpose, and then you go from uh, tensors to matrices. But this is not optimal. This is just like the lazy way of doing things. And, and there are some cases where you can do better. Once again, you need compilers for that. It's just too broad. But, but do you think that uh, the compilers will actually, like with, uh, with alpha tensor, uh, Will will we push it forward to not only create new schedules but also like discover fundamentally different algorithms yeah, so, yeah. that it will have let's say asymptotic at the, at different the complexity auto vectorization uh, auto vectorization has already shown the way. I mean, if you if you isolate a sub problem, make it scalable enough, uh, maybe Vigen the Vigen work from uh, from MIT for example shows the shows the way for for these type of, of problems. Yes. Okay, hey, thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed your answer. I'm not telling you how to do it. I'm, I'm quite sure we need compilers for that. I just, I just don't necessarily know how. So. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Yes, we have a question in the chat, if you're okay still to go because we are past the hour. Um, I may be the only master's student here, but I was wondering if there are any projects in automatic differentiation or a kind of RL for code optimization that you're working on that you can use as a master's student's, students work on. Uh, so you would have to ask uh, Billy Moses, I guess. Uh, so look at the Enzyme project. I know there are subtasks that have been advertised uh, on the community. So you may look at the LLVM uh, discourse <clears throat> uh, for, for, for uh, references on that. Uh, or please reach out in, uh, uh, offline. But generally, yes, they are. Uh, and um, uh, whether it's RL or whether it's just um, maybe more incremental uh, tuning of existing stuff so that you get into the, the process of understanding the bigger picture, uh, there, are, there are many um, uh, entry points. Uh, so MLIA itself is kind of challenging uh, as an environment for, 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 for beginners uh, because it's, um, I would not say it's over-engineered, but it's, uh, it's very abstract. So you have a lot of layers of abstraction before you actually come to concepts that you may learn about uh, at school in, um, in, in, in compiler classes, for example, uh, or in ML. Uh, uh, but uh, if you are familiar with LLVM, for example, uh, the, 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 the slope is much more gentle. Uh, and anyway, there is a lot of snow right now outside. So the, the, not all the gentle slopes are interesting. So you, you, you may want to tackle the challenge. Right, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions, so I would like to thank you again for a great presentation. Um, it's exciting to, exciting to be here. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, thank you all.